Alrighty guys, this is going to be, uh, we're like midway through the restoration of this video trivia cabinet. I wanted to talk a bit about um, the free play modification that you can do with pretty much any coin operated machine or electric, electronic coin operated machine. Not like a gumball machine or whatever, but <laughs> any arcade game, claw machine, um, what have you. And what it is is a free play modification. And what it does is it allows you to continuously use the coin mechanisms if you choose to do so. But it gives you a second option of just pressing a button to activate a game or to um, simulate the insertion of a quarter. This is my video trivia table that I've um, spent a great deal of time working on. We're going to talk a little bit later on about this particular machine, but this part is solely for anyone looking to install a free play modification. Or a free credit button. That's probably a more common term, a free credit button. But all it is, is a, uh, is a momentary contact button that you just mount to the door. Or you can mount it anywhere on the on the cabinet itself. I, I chose to mount mine on the door because I didn't want to drill holes in the cabinet. I wanted to keep it as original looking as possible. And I deliberately chose a square red momentary contact switch so that it would kind of blend in with the square uh, coin return buttons. And it has that 80s look. In fact, I think this button has been in production for more than 30 years. This is a Radio Shack button. Everything you see in this modification you can buy at Radio Shack. So, this is a just a simple momentary contact button. And what it does is when activated, allows you to simply press the button to um, trigger the coin mechanism switch. So we're going to open the door up here. And this is a freshly rewired door. I just finished all my wiring on this thing. and. So right here is where the switch is mounted. This is the reverse side of it. Now one of the key aspects of having something like this is that it needs to be, let's say you have a machine like this and you plan on just using it in your house or whatever, or at parties, when people will be gathered around and just, you know, here, have at it, have fun. But let's say you want to have the option of using it um, in an environment where it will require coins to start, um, or coin-op mode, as we'll call it from here on out. You want this machine to be able to be used in coin-op mode, and you want it to be switchable from coin-op to free. That's easily doable by adding a switch inside a secured part of the cabinet, uh, in this case behind the coin door. So when the coin door is locked, someone can't just walk up and flip a switch and play for free. So what I've done is I've mounted an L bracket on the inside of the cabinet with a toggle switch. That's it. And what this toggle switch does is it breaks the circuit or opens the circuit so that this button doesn't do anything. The wiring is very simple. I mean, really, this, this, this is about as easy as it gets. So you've got these um, momentary contact triggers. So when a coin is dropped in, it flips this uh, whisker and triggers the machine to um, it tells the machine that it co a coin has been inserted in to grant the user one credit or whatever the thing is set up to do and to make this work all you're really doing is jumping off of one leg of the switch going to this momentary contact button and going from the other side of the button all the way to this switch, which is just a simple single throw switch, open and closed. Well, this is actually a double throw switch, but that's not relevant right now. 
And then the other side of that switch is going all the way back, well in this case up, over, and down to the other side of the switch, um, the coin trigger. It's pretty damn simple. Now, I was going to add a pilot light or a, um, an indicator on the panel that tells you that the, um, the machine is in um, free play mode. I bought the lights. In fact, I have them. Well, they're not right here, but I bought one to just mount in the panel, and um, I changed my mind because I wanted a very simple, very clean installation. Um, but you can do that with a single, a double throw switch. All you do is run off the circuit, run your light off the circuit that drives the um, the coin return um, light, and run the and and, and run the um, the break in the circuit through the other side of the switch if you buy a double throw switch. It's pretty simple. Even a monkey can do it. And um, I am a monkey, so... That's it. And what that allows me to do is lock the coin door shut. I can even lock the cabinet closed if I want to with the... Uh, there's there's little uh, latches up in the up inside here. I can, I can lock the whole cabinet shut and uh, set it to one mode or the other. Now, this part of the video is about some of the work that I had done. For those of you who have been following my progress on this machine, I put a lot of work into it by, uh, so far. This entire coin door had to be replaced and painted because I bought a used coin door, I actually got it for nothing. I got a used coin door from a coworker, from my, um, I think he came out of a Midway pinball game or something like that. And um, it was in desperate need of a coat of paint. The original coin door that was on this was so far damaged from being in a humid environment. Uh, it, the, the pitting was so deep, I couldn't repaint it um, <clears throat> without doing some serious uh, reconnaissance. <laughs> it was in rough shape. The hinge was frozen solid. So when you open the door, it bent the hinge. I mean, it was just, it was, it was terrible, so... That whole coin door and the door frame are gone, and I have mounted this. So I had to drill holes to mount these carriage bolts, because the original one used cleats. But that's all covered in the previous video that is labeled coin door installation. <laughs> so if you want to see all that, you sure can. That's how you do it. So back inside, I wanted to go over the wiring work that had to be done. If you watched some of those earlier videos, you'll see that the power supply, which is a Peter Chow replacement power supply, this is a universal arcade game power supply. Basically it converts 110 volts AC or 120, whatever, down to a um, I think it's plus 12 and plus 5 volts. It also has a 5 volt 1 amp leg, which we're not using. Um, but it's a pretty simple uh, power supply, very cheap. They're usually fairly reliable from what I understand. And it is adjustable. Um, the power supply, when it was replaced, was a hack job. And I don't do hack jobs here. I try to do installations as clean as possible, and I try to make them look like they belong there. That's what I do. This power supply was mounted through one bracket on the floor. It was sitting, it was like hanging it was it was terrible. It was it wasn't even solidly mounted. And he mounted it against the side of the cabinet so there was no cross flow bet uh, through the unit, which is terrible. You really need to have um all the vents exposed. There's vents on front on the front, back and sides of this thing. If you can expose all of those vents, that's really the way to go. So I mounted it this way using two two mounting brackets instead of one, and now it's part of the cabinet. It's not going anywhere. The other thing I did is I had to take all the wiring off, straighten it out as best I could, separate things to, you know, to make them look good, <laughs> and in doing that, um, I also removed, I, I changed the, the wiring. Um, when they had originally wired this in, they didn't use any, uh, uh, crimp on connectors they just took the bare wire and wrapped it or didn't even wrap it they just stuck it between the screw and the and the plate it tightens into and um, and they put it on the wrong side 
So what happens is, let's say your the screw tightens in a clockwise direction. If you put the leg of uh, the wire on this side of the screw, so we're, let's say we're doing this one here, if it goes on this side and you tighten it, it's going to um, not. I'm sorry. If you put it on this side here, when you tighten it, it forces the wire out. Okay, it, it actually comes out of the. Uh, the um, it, it, it unwinds it off the post, basically. That's not how you wire in a power supply. That's completely wrong. It's dangerous and it looks bad and it's not very it's not very durable either. So what I had done is I I um, put each wire into these uh, fork connectors, which are really cheap. I mean, it doesn't cost much to do it this way, but it also makes it easier to service when you want to take the leg off for whatever reason, you just unscrew it, pop it out, do your thing, whatever. Um, so I was really disappointed with the way they had wired it. And it was a jumbled mess. And the power supply was hanging on by a thread. But it gets worse. As I was working on the machine, I discovered that on the filter, which I later determined is, is perfectly fine, the filter anyway, um, the spade connectors were coming undone. They were the original spade connectors and when they had originally built it at the factory they had stripped off, they had cut into the wire too far with the stripping tool and um, so let's say uh, they're using 16 gauge wire they had cut it down to somewhere along the lines of like 30 gauge wire. <laughs> it was it was terrible. I mean, there were like one or two threads or one or two strands of wire carrying the entire load on the 115 volt side to the machine. That is a recipe for disaster. It's actually a fire hazard. And I don't do fire hazards. I, I, I um, do everything I can to avoid them. So I went ahead and I replaced those two spade connectors. Oops, zoomed in too far there. Those two red spade connectors I replaced because they were not safe. Um, <clears throat> I also found a similar situation with the lockout wire, which is uh, that white cable that you see. Originally, that cable went all the way to the front of the machine and connected to a lockout switch here. It's a safety feature, a very good one, um, which I have defeated. It's designed to protect the operator of the machine from touching the high voltage side of the monitor when he's emptying the coin bucket. Um, so I, I took that out because my coin door didn't have provisions to use such a thing. I could have made it happen but I didn't really care. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so, and what that, that that was actually a very good lockout switch because it disconnected the hot and neutral sides at the same time. Um, but anyway, so that's been defeated and I just replaced that long cable. I shortened it down to a jumper cable which goes from the power switch over to the fuse block down there. And uh, so that's some of the wiring I had to do. Oh, the chassis ground, or the, the earth ground, which is this green wire here, I installed because there wasn't one. When they installed this new power supply, they f forgot or neglected to install an earth ground, which you kind of need <laughs> for safety purposes. And it's supposed to connect directly to the box, the uh, the line filter box, which it does now. I also reconnected the earth ground um, that goes up to the coin door and to the motherboard um, because, again, you need that. That should be there. It's supposed to be there. God put it there for a reason. The other wiring fiasco I fixed was the volume knob here, which is just a simple potentiometer. They, um, there is a ground wire that connects to chassis ground and uh, they had failed to reconnect it when they replaced the power supply because the wire was too short and apparently wire was at a premium then because they didn't replace it with a longer one I don't know, whatever <laughs> oh, I've seen strange things but this is whatever so the reason for the ground wire is actually to reduce um, static or um, noise distortion in the sound in the audio circuit 
um, due to buildup of electrical charges, it, it discharges any um, stray voltages or something like that. I'm not an engineer. Is it obvious? No. I know how to wire stuff, but I don't beyond me how it works. Um, so I've also learned a few things, which is mentioned earlier in a previous video. Um, these machines were built very cheaply, and if they could save a few bucks on a relay by powering entire components right off of these um, Darlington transistors, which are these there's three of them, they would do that. that that's a heavy load for a transistor, like this, uh, this size of a transistor. Um, when, what they were doing is they were actually powering up the lockout coils and the um, the coin door lights. Like, what the hell? Um, whatever. I don't know, man. But And also, in their infinite cheapness, this really thin wire. <laughs> Actually, I guess it's, it's probably the same gauge as this, but I doubt that for some reason. Um, it's just very light, very light wire. And this is what powers the CRT. Just, um, you know, more cheapness. Another ground wire I replaced, I think it's supposed to be an earth ground, but they had it connected to a chassis ground. And that's this one here. Uh, this goes from the CRT chassis on down to the, um, chassis ground. I don't know if that's supposed to be that way. I should check the schematic, which, thank God... I have, which fits nicely right there, out of the way. I like that. Well, guys, um, what do you say we play a game of trivia? It's all fixed up. Oh, and I made the cabinet look a little bit nicer, too. I cleaned it with bleach, and a Clorox cleanup is what I use. And I put a nice le a coating of um, armor all, actually. And it kind of brought the shine back to the uh, to the to the wood grain veneer or overlay. It's actually a printed veneer. All right, ready? I'm gonna power this baby up. Oh, and I cleaned the power cord. I got all the mold off of it. Bleach works amazingly well for stuff like that. So I want to make sure that I'm in free play mode. There we go. I kind of would like to put an LED or something there to indicate that the machine is in free play mode, but I decided against it. It's really not necessary. Okay, we've got lights now. So we're going to do one credit for one player. And you just have to press it lightly like that because if you hold it down, this is what happens. See? Boing, boing. But watch if I hold it down too long goes into coin jam mode. And I believe that serves two purposes. Number one, if there is in fact a coin jam, it will alert the attendant to come fix it. But it also plays another role. See, here, I'm going to reset it. To reset it, you flick it in test mode, the switch right here on the top, and then flick it back down to play mode. Now, what that does is, let's say I'm looking to play the game for free. And a lot of people were doing this back when they were using washers, slugs, whatever they could find. If somebody were to insert a slug and it made it into that um, channel where it would flick the switch and got stuck, then that person would get... Um, their, how can I put this? This would alert the attendant to possible fraud um, or possible uh, theft of services, I guess, or somebody just trying to rip the machine off. So that's, unfortunately, I can't disable that. There is a way, though, if I really wanted to, I actually have a friend who is an electrical engineer who could design this for me, and that is to devise a circuit that or find a switch that just does this. But to find a, or develop a circuit that when a momentary pulse is sent to it, it trips a relay like that. And it doesn't allow that relay to be tripped again until the switch is released and pressed again. So this way the relay controls the 
triggering action to a very short pulse, which the game will accept. If I could find a button, however, that does the same thing, that has an actual switch instead of a plunger, or like if I press the button, it clicks, and if I hold it down, it doesn't, it, it only closes for a brief second, then that would solve the problem. But I'm not going to worry so much about that. It's really not that big a deal. Um, so where were we? Uh, so I got five credits in there now. Let's do a one player game. I'm going to pull up my chair and play this thing 80s style. Alright, so I got my bank of lights in front of me. This is cool. I love this thing. I'm going to do, let's see, science. Let's see how stupid I am in science. What does a sphygmonometer measure? I actually think I know the answer to that. It's blood pressure. Yes! Okay, good. Sweet. Next. Besides man, what is the most intelligent creature on Earth? It is a dolphin. What country consumes more cheese per capita than any other country? I think it's France. Yes. Wee oui, wee. Oui. I have 263,800 points. What is a barnacle? I know the answer to that. It is an animal. Okay, yes. And up to 100 and... Look at how many points I have. Oh my lord. Bonus question. Robert Fulton is credited with what invention? I used to know that. I think it's number one. It is! Oh my god. <laughs> I got it right. Do we get another bonus question? What is the second full moon in a month called? A blue moon. I have 1,520,100 points. Another bonus question. What do English men and English women weigh themselves in? I believe it's stones. <laughs> what the hell? I'm getting these right. Why? <laughs> Another bonus round. What planet is closest to the sun? It is Earth. No, it's Mercury. Alright, I'm just saying. For a second I thought they threw me a curve ball. Let's see. How high do I get to be in... Hey, it's supposed to ask me for my initials. Do I get to return with the same high points I had? No, it starts me off at 10,000. It doesn't let me go... Oh, that's stupid. Which zodiac sign is represented by the scales? Uh, Virgo? Oh, no, it's Libra. Ah, so it's, now it's going to kill me. Oh, well. Hmm. Planet Jupiter has how many moons? Oh, I don't know that. Seriously? What, what's up with you? Um, ten moons. Nope, it's thirteen. Dear God. Alright. A decagon has how many sides? That's ten. Final round. What is a California long white? Potato. Don't ask me how I know that, because I don't know how I know that. Game over. And now it's going to ask me for my high score name, right? Of course. You suck. I wanted my high, high score in there, but I guess it... Let's uh, go into the risque section. Alright, here we go. This is, this is going to be fun. 
This supposed aphrodisiac is called, it's also known as the stinky rose. Oh my god. Garlic. BNE is a medical abbreviation referring to what? <laughs> Look at these answers. It's bilateral nipple erection. I didn't think that could have been real. I'm sorry. No. Alright, what's next? The ancient Greek practice of pederast ped pederasty involves an older man and... Oh, God. Don't tell me. No, it's a young man. Oh boy. Oh boy. Is it... Oh my god. What type of... Oh my god. Oh, I know the answer to that one because I've already gotten this question before. The answer is... Three. Oh man. Well, I think we're done. Another 26 minute video down. Look at that. <laughs> wow.